This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then you can replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the anatomy of the arm and forearm. A 17-year-old male is brought to the ER after an injury while falling. Lateral radiograph of his left arm is attached, showing a supracondylar fracture of the humerus. Which nerve is most likely injured by the jagged edges of the proximal fragment? And which artery is jeopardized by the proximal fragment? This is an x-ray showing a lateral view of the elbow with the humerus, radius, and ulna. The fracture in the humerus is at the distal end of the humerus, a supracondylar fracture. Note that the injury force has displaced the condyles backward. That's to say the trochlea and the capitulum are displaced backwards. The lower end of the proximal fragment is carried forward and downward. The brachial artery as well as the median and radial nerves may become compressed by fragments of the proximal bone or by the blood that infiltrates the cubital fossa from bleeding resulting from stripping of the periosteum. The nerve most likely injured is the median nerve, less commonly the radial nerve. The artery that is affected is thus the brachial artery. Injury or compression of the brachial artery can result in Volkmann's contracture. Although there is a collateral circulation around the elbow, this may not compensate for the occlusion of the brachial artery, resulting in ischemia of the flexor muscles of the forearm and partial necrosis. The muscles would be replaced by fibrous tissue after necrosis and the muscles will become thin and shortened, resulting in a flexion deformity of the wrists and fingers called Volkmann's ischemic contracture. Identify the bony prominence A, which muscle is attached to it. This is a tuberosity on the lateral side of the humerus, at the middle of its shaft. Note that if you want to identify the sides of the humerus, the medial side of the humerus has two prominent features. The head of the humerus is located medially at its proximal end. At the distal end of the humerus, the prominent medial epicondyle can be easily identified comparing it to the less prominent lateral epicondyle. The tubercle in question provides attachment for deltoid muscle and it's called the deltoid tuberosity. The bone opposite to it on the medial side provides attachment for coracobrachialis muscle. Identify the muscle A and nerve B Name the fibrous tissue located deep to the nerve. This is a deep dissection of the flexor compartment of the forearm showing the radius and ulna and in between them the whitish fibrous membrane is called the interosseous membrane. As its name indicates, it is located between two bones. The interosseous membrane is thin but a strong membrane uniting the interosseous borders of the radius and ulna. Its fibers run obliquely downward and medially, that's to say, from the radius down to the ulna, and it provides for the muscle attachment. It also transmits forces from the wrist to the elbow via the lower end of the radius. Remember that the radius participates in the formation of the wrist joint, but the ulna does not. So the interosseous membrane transmits forces that will be transmitted to the radius it transmits them from the radius to the ulna and then to the upper end of the ulna and then to the humerus. Now returning to the muscles and the nerve, you will notice here that all the muscles of the flexor or anterior compartment of the forearm were removed, leaving only one muscle that is the deepest muscle. It is located distally, quadriangular in shape, with fibers running transversely and extending from the ulna to the radius. Thus, it moves the radius on the ulna in pronation, so it is the pronator quadratus muscle, and its name reflects its action 
and shape, pronator action quadratus, quadriangular in shape. Pronator quadratus initiates pronation, but pronator teres is used when more speed and power is required. The pronator quadratus muscle also helps the interosseous membrane to hold the radius and ulna together. Now the nerve B that lies immediately in front of the interosseous membrane is the anterior interosseous nerve. This nerve is derived from the median nerve. It is shown here to supply pronator quadratus, but this is not the only muscle supplied by this nerve. It also supplies the other muscles of the deep group of the flexor compartment of the forearm. And these are the flexor pollicis longus and the lateral half of flexor digitorum profundus. Which arterial pulsations are felt in A and B? Artery A is compressed against the front of the distal end of the radius. It is the radial artery. The first tendon encountered medial to the artery is that of the flexor carpi radialis. Artery B is felt most medially and it is the ulnar artery. It can be felt just lateral to the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. Which bone occupies each of the fossae A and B during flexion of the elbow joint? And identify the bony edge C. This is the front of the distal end of the humerus. Note the prominent medial epicondyle and compare it to the less prominent lateral epicondyle. Superior to the medial epicondyle is the medial supracondylar ridge, which provides attachment for the medial intermuscular septum of the arm. The medial and lateral intermuscular septa of the arm divide the arm into two compartments, an anterior flexor compartment and a posterior extensor compartment. The lateral intermuscular septum is evidently attached to the lateral supracondylar ridge. Note the trochlea of the humerus on the medial side. It articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna. During full flexion, the coronoid process of the ulna engages with the fossa on the front of the humerus. Thus, fossa B is called the coronoid fossa. On the lateral side, the capitulum of the humerus articulates with the head of the radius, and during full flexion, the head of the radius engages with fossa A, which is thus called the radial fossa. Which joint is more likely dislocated in this kid after such a pull? The joint is the proximal or superior radio ulnar joint. This lies between the head of the radius and the radial notch of the ulna. This is the joint that is most likely dislocated. It's a pivot joint permitting rotation of the radius about the ulna in pronation and supination. In the superior radio ulnar joint, the head of the radius is held in position by the annular ligament, which is a U-shaped ligament. Thus, it surrounds the head of the radius and is attached to the margins of the radial notch of the ulna. It is funnel-shaped in adults, but its sides are vertical in young children. A sudden pull of the arm of a child, thus, may subluxate or partially dislocate the radial head through the ligament. This is called pulled elbow or nursemaid's elbow. It may be reduced by powerful supination of the elbow, which returns the head back into place. Identify the arteries one to four. This is an angiogram of the distal end of the arm and the forearm. Artery one is located in front of the elbow joint and at this position, it is in the cubital fossa, and it is the brachial artery. The brachial artery ends opposite the neck of the radius in the inferior part of the cubital fossa, about 2.5 cm distal to the elbow skin crease. It ends by dividing into radial and ulnar arteries. So four is the radial artery, and three is the ulnar artery. The radial artery continues, as you can see here, as the direct line of the brachial artery. Note here in the cubital fossa at the beginning of the radial artery, it supplies a radial recurrent artery, which arises from the radial artery, just distal to its origin, and it anastomoses, it is recurrent, it goes upwards, recurs, 
and anastomosis with the anterior descending branch of the profunda brachii artery, which is a branch of the brachial artery, proximal part of the brachial artery. Now look at three, the ulnar artery. The ulnar artery leaves the cubital fossa in a gentle curve. It is not straight like the radial artery. In the cubital fossa, it supplies the anterior and posterior ulnar recurrent arteries. You can see them here from the proximal part of the ulnar artery. Again, their names recurrent means that they recur backwards and they anastomose with branches coming from the brachial artery. And these are the inferior and superior ulnar collateral arteries. The ulnar artery has another branch, which is number two. It is the common interosseous artery. As you can see it here, it arises from the ulnar artery in the distal part of the cubital fossa and divides into anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. That's why it's called common, because it divides afterwards into anterior and posterior interosseous arteries. The posterior interosseous artery passes posteriorly between the radius and ulna, hence the name interosseous between two bones. It gives off a small recurrent branch, which also participates in the anastomosis around the elbow joint, uniting with the posterior descending branch of the profunda brachii artery. Now, note here that the anterior interosseous artery is larger than the posterior interosseous and extends more distally in the forearm. This artery, the anterior interosseous artery, in addition to supplying the flexor compartment of the forearm, it sends perforating branches through the interosseous membrane for the deep extensor muscles and the extensor compartment of the forearm, which is also supplied by the posterior interosseous artery. At the distal end of the forearm, the artery then passes posteriorly through the interosseous membrane at the upper border of pronator quadratus muscle. This is because at the distal end of the extensor compartment, the small posterior interosseous artery is exhausted and it is aided by the anterior, larger anterior interosseous artery, which pierces the distal part of the interosseous membrane. Which nerve is surgically exposed? This is the medial side of the elbow where the ulnar nerve is exposed. The ulnar nerve arises from the medial cord of the brachial plexus in the axilla, then gradually passes from the flexor to the extensor compartment of the arm by piercing the medial intermuscular septum of the arm. For a short distance, it traverses the extensor compartment of the arm, where it passes behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus to enter the forearm and return back to the anterior side of the limb by entering the flexor compartment of the forearm by passing through the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris muscle. It seems odd that the nerve should enter the posterior compartment above the elbow and then return to the front of the forearm below the elbow, but this is useful when the nerve may be transposed to the front of the elbow, thus getting some extra length and preventing stretching of the nerve. Flexor carpi ulnaris has two heads. In addition to the common flexor origin, the muscle has an extra origin by means of an aponeurosis, a wide flat tendon, from the posterior subcutaneous border of the ulna. The ulnar nerve can be injured at the elbow, where it lies behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus by a fracture of the medial epicondyle or by a dislocation of the elbow joint. But the nerve may also be entrapped by compression in the cubital tunnel formed by the tendinous arch joining the humeral and ulnar heads of attachment of flexor carpi ulnaris. This is what we call cubital tunnel syndrome. Here, the ulnar nerve was trapped in the cubital tunnel, which is exposed and released by cutting the fascia over flexor carpi ulnaris, and then the ulnar nerve is transposed anteriorly to avoid further compression. 